It was extremely intense. You know, you were it. There wasn't anybody else. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. The only thing I was scared of was failing, was letting down the people there that I was supposed to support. Things went south really bad. You've got to have an element of crazy to be good at what we do. There was an ego attached to being a gunfighter. Being around big tall trees, thick shrubbery, potentially connecting to other moments in his life during battle. It's not easy to get out and walk in a minefield not knowing when your legs were going to get blown off. You know you're a part of the society. The story of transformation is powerful. Madelon Hoiki was a nurse in the Royal Australian Air Force. In 1965, she was deployed to Butterworth, Malaysia, where she nursed Australian soldiers that had been wounded in action in the Vietnam War. This is her conversation with Angus Horden, where she gave us a nurse's perspective to the Vietnam conflict. I'm Angus Horden, and I'm speaking today with Madeline Hoiki. Dell, welcome to our podcast. Thank you very much. Dell, it's interesting. We come to you on a Sunday in April with the coronavirus having infections being noted as being very high right now. And we're reflecting back now in time to 1941 when you were born. It must have been quite a scary thing for your parents to bring you into the world at that time. I've reflected on that, obviously, because 1941 was a particularly difficult time for Australia. As history tells, the Sydney was sunk off Geraldton and suddenly Australia began to realise that they weren't an island, that they were really involved. Interestingly, with the COVID-19, we've also started to have that same sort of mentality, that we're an island and we're trying desperately to isolate ourselves. Dale, I understand that your dad at the time was an aircraft fitter and he was very disappointed because like many of the able men at the time, he wanted to go and serve. And as you said, 41 was actually the critical year and 42 for us. Do you remember his frustration at home? No, but later I do. He was always disappointed and, in fact, when the RSL was quite specific about the people that could join it in the late 40s was that you had to have operational service and he didn't. And so he felt like he was a a lesser person, although he was a volunteer and it's the luck of the draw if you get posted somewhere where, uh, you know, you gain operational service. In fact, it's really quite unfair. Dell, I understand that you had a country upbringing. I was born out of Gosford at Holgate. And then after the war, when Dad came home, he bought a property at a place called Pete's Ridge, which is now, you know, you can commute to Sydney. But in those days, it was a dirt road and it was a a very long trip to Sydney. There was no um, Hawkesbury River Bridge. It was a ferry going across. So that to go to Sydney was a big exercise. You eventually leave the farm and you want to start your own career, but your dad wasn't so happy about that. He thought I would never stand the discipline of nursing or nurse training. I think probably I was quite an outspoken youngster. I railed against the rules he thought I should abide by. I wanted to go nursing and my mother said, well, if you're going to go nursing, you're going to go to the best place. And so that I was very lucky to go to Royal Prince Alfred in Sydney. And I can remember having done interviews to be able to get in there, that the matron of the day said to me, oh, yes, we do like to take some country girls who've been to public schools because it was a place where really a lot of the private school girls and and, and it was considered the top of the training schools at the time. So what actually led you to go into nursing? Oh, it had my tonsils and adenoids out. 
I'd had my appendix out and I thought I loved the way nurses could be. Um, I mean, in those days, of course, they all wore stiffly starched aprons and, and hats and things like that. And it was their capacity to be able to be in charge of the situation that I found really, I think, probably was something that I felt that I would like to do. And, and their competence, their competence was amazing. I imagine that during your service in the nursing, you would have had experiences of, sadly, you know, men being stabbed and gunshot wounds. Royal Prince Alfred at that stage was um, in the middle of Newtown, Redfern area. Also in those days, this, I started nursing in 1958. And at, in those days, there was a, a lot of pub fights and that sort of thing. And yes, I mean, I accident and emergency on a Saturday night at Royal Prince Alfred was absolute mayhem. So that would have given you like a war zone or, or later a bit of a military experience of things to come perhaps? Perhaps, but I wasn't even thinking about it at that stage. Nursing in those days was four years four years of uh, unmitigated slavery, might I add. We were paid three pounds, which is about six dollars. It was hard work. And nurses were expected to be cleaners. We had a lot of mundane work to do. I was only thinking just recently being um, locked in my in my room and not going to being able to go anywhere. I was down to polishing the taps and I thought, gee, that was something that we used to have to do and be inspected for. Dell, when you eventually finish your training, where do they actually post you? So I was still a civilian then and I took up a job at a little country hospital called Tullamore, an hour's drive from Parks into the centre of New South Wales. And it was a little hospital, a little eight bed hospital. I was there employed as a general nursing sister. And that was extremely interesting. As a young woman, uh, I mean, I was only 21 then, and the young fellows from the town used to come in with all sorts of excuses to check out the new nursing sister. One of them said, uh, what are you doing Saturday night? And I said, oh, well, what is there to do? Because Tullamore had one pub and one bank. That was about it. Oh, well, he said, we could go roo shooting. <laughs> and I thought, gee, you know, yes. <laughs> So I have to say I did go roo shooting a couple of times, but it was a lonely existence. And I saw an ad in the paper for nursing sisters in the Air Force. So that ad inspired you to leave and join the Air Force? I thought, gee, you know, this wouldn't be too bad, so I applied. And your brother also followed your dad's footsteps in becoming an aircraft engineer? Yes, he did. He did his as a civilian through de Havilland's. But ultimately, he went to Vietnam as well, and he went as a civilian working for an aircraft company called Pacific Architects and Engineers. They were a bit like Honeywell during the Vietnam War. They did a lot of supplies and that sort of thing. Dill, you join up and you pass your tests and you undertake the aviation medicine course at Point Cook and become a section officer in the Royal Australian Air Force. When do you first start hearing of the rumblings of the war in Vietnam? When I first joined up, I was posted to Laverton, where there was a hospital. And then I was posted to Richmond and the hospital at Richmond. In the mess of an evening, sometimes the young fellows were making jokes about um, polishing off their medals and things like that because they thought something was coming. I think I was at Richmond for probably two years. Well, there wasn't a lot spoken about it at that stage. It wasn't until 1964-65 when we actually got involved. You're then posted to the Air Force Base at Butterworth in Malaysia. As a section officer nurse, yes. Yeah. And you're keeping in touch with the people back home. I imagine that would have been very difficult for you from up there. We could write letters home because we weren't involved in Vietnam yet. Confrontation was going on with Indonesia and there we had troops fighting in Borneo. 
the first sign of anything that I recognised was that the boys that had been at Richmond with me arrived in the mess one evening and they'd been, the Neptunes had arrived. Now the Neptunes were actually flying over the Sydney to make sure that it got through the areas of Indonesia, I imagine the Indonesian waters. And so that they turned up and of course, you know, there were jokes about, well, I can't tell you what I'm doing because I'd have to kill you and that sort of thing. But really, I, I didn't seem, didn't tweak that anything like that was happening until we got a couple of um, the training group, a couple of soldiers from the training group were admitted to us. They didn't say anything either. So it wasn't until May 1965 that we began to realise that something nasty was going on up there. Do you remember your first casualties that did come in? Oh, yes. First medevac that came from Vietnam were from one RAR. They were based at Benoit. This was about 15 miles northwest of Saigon. There were four or five of them. There was a Lance Corporal Mundy, Errol Weatherall, another fellow that had been shot in the face and he was taken down to Singapore because there was a orofacial surgeon there. They're the first four. Now, I didn't do that medevac, but we looked after them. I nursed those gentlemen in the wards. I guess we were caught a bit unprepared because we had to do that medevac in a um, in an old DC-3 and they were using the equipment that they'd used in medevacs from Korea so that it was a really patch up and let's get organised sort of process. So, Del, you were actually then going to Vietnam to get your casualties and to bring them back? Yes. What would happen, we would get a signal. And, of course, in those days there was uh, no emails or anything like that. It had come out on an old printer, a signal telling us the casualties that we had to collect. And that meant that it gave us an opportunity to prepare the sort of equipment that we might need so that that was part of our responsibility as the nurse doing the medevac was to load up the equipment that you felt that you would probably need to use. If it was an emergency, then we would use the old Dakota. It was obviously, you know, the Dakotas were in the Second World War, so that they were less than comfortable. And uh, the only thing was that they had a very, very good heating system. But usually we would do the medevacs on the Hercules. Now, the Hercules were running from Richmond to Butterworth and they would unload stores and that sort of thing. Then we would load our gear on and we would then fly to Saigon or Tonsonut Airport. The Hercules don't have very adequate toilet facilities. In fact, the old A model's toilet was a thing that folded down from the side of the aeroplane and you had to mount these two or three steps up and, and sit on this can. And the thing was that it was supposed to have a curtain that went round it. Now, the curtain would be torn and tattered and, and sometimes there was hardly any left. So that I have to admit that going to the toilet on a Hercules was an experience I ever participated in. But when we got to Saigon, you probably needed to go to the toilet. And the Australian Army put on some poor sergeant who had to pick up the nursing sisters and take them to the toilet. And I often think, you know, if their children were saying, what did you do in the war, Daddy? They would say, we took the nurses to the toilet. Del, can you tell us about the major hospital there and Purple Heart Day? Well, the major hospital in Saigon was the Third Field Hospital. I think it was an old school. It was built in a sort of a Spanish style with big wide verandas around it. It had a couple of dust-off helicopter positions and the same sergeant that took us to the toilet would take us into um, the Tonsonut, so uh, into the Third Field Hospital so that we could pick up our patients. It was a US Army hospital and they were really eager to move their patients through as quickly as they could. So quite often we would find our patients on their stretches out on the veranda just waiting for us to turn up. 
one day though we got there and our patients weren't quite ready and this young man said oh do you want to come around and have a look he escorted us around to have there were two nurses he escorted us around to have a look and they had their mass unit where they brought people in and, and triaged them and then operated on them and that was quite I mean, that was a huge big classroom that had builders, saw horses. They'd unload the patients from the helicopters, bring them in, stick them on the saw horses and then triage them and then move them into the theatre. When we talk triage, it looks at who's the most urgent, uh, then the person that can wait a while, and then the, the one that might bring it up third or possibly wasn't going to make it anyway. So we walked around the, the wards and it was really, really interesting. Um, you know, I saw some diseases that you would never see, like smallpox and things like that. It was a Thursday and Thursday was Purple Heart Day. There's this officer walking around with a um, secondary person behind him carrying on a cushion all these purple hearts. And um, each soldier was given a purple heart because he had an injury. I think the poor fellas that just had malaria didn't get one. But anyway, and then uh, we went down to where the helicopters were parked. There was a young fellow there who was waiting for a chopper to go back out and he said he had two purple hearts. He'd got one and we'd gone to go out to get back to his unit and got shot down again so he came back in again and had two. So that explains why some of the Americans have such long metal ribbons. You were collecting about 15 patients and some had gunshot wounds, explosive wounds, malaria as you mentioned. How did you go and recouping these guys back to Butterworth? Uh, they'd come out to the aircraft in ambulances. We'd load them on. The other thing that you have to do is make sure that you've got enough of their intravenous fluids. I'm just reminded of one gentleman who'd been shot in the face and he had his jaws wired. One of the great difficulties is if your jaws are wired, you can't vomit. And if he got air sick, we would be in big trouble. So I had some anti-nauseant medication to be able to give him and I crushed it up and put it in a syringe and squeezed it down into the side of his mouth. And then unfortunately our aeroplane went unserviceable. So we were stuck on the, the side of the airport for a while while they tried it and fixed it up. And this chap, because he was able to walk, sort of disappeared for a while. And when he came back, he said to me, oh gee, he said, that feels better. I've had a beer, a local beer and uh, some local food. And I thought, oh my, my goodness, you know, and I've given him an anti nauseant <laughs> You had to have side cutter pliers in case they got air sick. You'd have to cut the wire so that they could vomit because otherwise they'd inhale it and make things worse. One of the things that will take me back there is the smell of toe jam and because these blokes wore their boots in water and out of water and sometimes she'd take their socks off and most of the skin had come off with their socks. One of the ways that the surgical techniques of gunshot wounds were that they packed them with sponges and then plastered around the whole plaster of Paris covering and so that when that came off the smell was something that you will never forget. They were smelly, their clothes were quite rotted when we got them back to Butterworth, they were all concerned about their webbing. You know, that's part of their uniform and they signed for it. Their webbing and their gun and their boots, you know. that. And if they lose them, they had to repay the, the cost of them. So that I can remember, uh, you know, that plonking their webbing on the end of their bed and saying, here's your webbing, you know, it, it's okay. And when we got back to Butterworth, they still had live grenades on their webbing. And poor loadmaster, he nearly had a fit because <laughs> he would stand up the front and say, you know, this is how you do and this is what we do and if the aeroplane's going to crash, you know. And, I mean, it was just if the aeroplane was going to crash, we'd have 15 fellas all tied into the aeroplane. I mean, it, it wasn't going to make a lot of difference. But the loadmaster was acting like a hostess. And then when he found that we had live grenades, he wondered where it had gone wrong, I think. Del, are there some other particular memorable patients that you treated? They're all memorable in a way. Ross Mangano, who 
had lost one leg and really didn't have very much left of the other one. And Ross actually led the coming home parade. And if you see videos of that, you will see him out the front walking with his crutches. An amazing fellow. One particular bloke who'd been shot with a machine gun right across his belly and he'd lost a lot of, of his belly. And he had to be made to walk because otherwise everything would have tightened up and he would have got such gross adhesions that he probably would have walked bent over for the rest of his life. He didn't want to walk. His language was uh, quite uninviting at times. The one way I found to make him walk, he used to tell me that if he could get me, he'd knock my effing head off. So I used to stand about, you know, about two metres in front of him and say, well, come and get me and you can knock my effing head off. But um, he, once he got to a certain point, I'd say to him, well, you can go back to bed now, you're OK. And uh, he'd mutter and scream, but at least we got him home. And I believe he's still alive, or he was still alive. So that, I mean, it might have been harsh, but it worked. So, Dale, you obviously went through periods of intense stress and strain. How intense was that workload when you were doing those evac missions? It was extremely intense. You know, you were it. There wasn't anybody else. It took a fair amount of strength, using every inch of your knowledge. But, in fact, it was what you were trained to do and there was a certain element of satisfaction associated with that. It was tough but unlike a lot of things you could see that there were positive outcomes. So all the training that you had done going back to Royal Prince Alfred and then with the military it never quite prepares you for the catastrophe of war and the suffering of men that you were going with. That is a thought that comes to me in retrospect. But when I was in the middle of it, I didn't have time to think about it. You were just so busy. And of course, I was very young and I'd met the man that ultimately became my husband. So, you know, life was just giddy. It was full of excitement, but not always good excitement. But certainly it was intense and that's probably the best wording I can use. And you would have gained solace with camaraderie with your fellow nurses? Oh, gosh, yes. Somebody said once, you know, you drank it down and I suspect probably we did. In those days, drinking and smoking and, and partying were the things you did when you were off duty. Yeah, I mean, a release for the pressure that was building up. I think so, yes, I think so. When did you get the odd moment to yourself? Because I understand some couples used to nip down to the beach together. There were a couple, oh, there were three or four romances going at the time. And you have to understand, I think that there were only about 20 nurses and about 200 young pilots and navigators and that sort of thing in the mess so that it was bound to happen. As I said before, we were in the middle of confrontation and so that the mess at Butterworth was right on the beach. It was a really spectacular position. But right on the beach also was a, um, a gun emplacement with a whole lot of, and I don't know whether they were New Zealanders or Australians, but was obviously, it was a big gun. They were there and of course they had a, a spotlight to be able to see if the Indonesians were coming, but mostly they looked to see who was going out with who and ruined any sort of a close engagement on, on the couple's part. And Del, as you were saying, you met your husband in Malaysia. Was he in the mess as well? Yeah, he was a navigator on Canberra. After 12 months in May 1966, your deployment finishes and you return home. What happens to your Air Force career after that? We got engaged before Fred came home. Fred came home about four or five months before me. He then had to write and say, yes, he intended that we would get married. And the moment that happened, my service was no longer considered necessary. It wasn't put like that. It was, I was no longer suitable for service. The moment you became married, that you couldn't still stay in. You know, Dill, that's funny because the nurses who pioneered the way in the First World War were the same, that they were fine to serve at Gallipoli and on the Western Front, but as soon as they married someone, they sent them home. I don't see how it would have made you a lesser nurse being married or not. In fact, having the support of your husband there, you would think, would be a positive, but 
But anyway, look, you're sent home. Fred is still on Canberra's. Because they were short of pilots because Vietnam was going, Fred had applied to do pilots course because that was what he'd wanted to do originally in joining the Air Force. But had they chosen to make him a navigator so that he um, applied to become a pilot. And as a flight lieutenant, he was accepted to be a pilot. So he'd come back and was at Point Cook doing his flying training. And when I came back, I came back in the April. We got married over Easter and then I went down to Melbourne while he was doing flying training. But even then, you weren't supposed to be married on flying training. So that because we got married and so that I um, was sort of a uh, an addition to his the service, but got no, uh, you know, wasn't treated like a wife when he went to do his jet flying over in South Australia, I mean, in Western Australia. We had to pay for the move all ourselves and pay my fare and everything else wasn't so very, easy. Very difficult, yeah. I understand, Fred, when he's posted to Vietnam to be a caribou pilot. I mean, the caribous were an excellent aircraft. I mean, it was actually a highly hazardous. I mean, if you had to be a pilot, there were far safer planes to fly because they used to throw them onto these mountain tracks. They were famous for that. I mean, if you were a caribou pilot, you were a great pilot. So, Dale, amongst Fred and his flights up in um, Vietnam, you had your daughter. We had Linda before Fred went. Linda was um, just nine months old when Fred went to Vietnam. That must have been very difficult with you having your daughter at home, Fred being back in Vietnam. That was good and bad, I suppose, because I knew what he was doing, which a lot of wives wouldn't have had a clue. But knowing what he was doing in some ways made it worse. And of course, as I've alluded to before, communication was just so difficult. We used to send tapes to each other. But, you know, it was a three or four week turnaround before you, you'd send a tape and you'd be dealing with things as they were right at that moment. And then you'd get a tape back and whatever you'd been talking about had already passed and letters. 12 months of really being, it was really quite tough. Did Fred's military career result in any other great upheavals in your life? Well, yes. He came back from Vietnam. It wasn't very long after. He was sent to New Guinea, Papua New Guinea. And while he was there, he rang me to say that we'd been, by this time, we'd had a son, three months old. And Fred rang me to say that we'd been posted to Papua New Guinea. And so that with a three-month-old baby and a one-year-old, one-and-a-half-year-old little girl, and Fred was in New Guinea, I sold the house, sold the car, sold the TV, packed up the house, and the Air Force let him come home for three days so we could have an uplift. That sounds like a religious experience, but it wasn't. And off we went to Papua New Guinea for over two years. And were you based at Moresby? Yes. He flew everywhere, all over Papua New Guinea and Bougainville and uh, New Britain. And what was he flying then? Just in the Caribou still. Caribou, Caribou still. still. How did you find living in Moresby? Because it's known that, you know, there are some rough parts to it now. Was it okay then? No, it was still quite rough. We employed a houseboy. He came from Lufa, which is up in the Highlands. I learned pigeon quite quickly, and so we were able to talk about what was going on. He was very conscious about keeping us reasonably safe. I had a gun. We had wire on the windows, and our dog got stabbed, and, uh, mm. you know, there was a fair bit of, of stuff that was. Oh, and I got attacked a couple of times. I got attacked with a rock through the windscreen, and somebody jumped on the front of the car. It was pretty awful. Anyway, I um, worked at a uh, squatter settlement mission as a nurse, got involved in that with a priest called Father Frank Flynn, who'd been quite famous as during the Northern Territory and that sort of thing. And he came and saw me and asked me, would I like to go and help? So I said, yes, I'd go and help. And there was a nun running it. And of course, as soon as I turned up, the nun got sent somewhere else. So there was a, there I was. And I used to be able to take 
Peter, my son, have him in a um, playpen, you know, and, and the Marys would come and look at him. And one of the interesting things in New Guinea, you were not allowed to wean a baby off the breast onto a bottle. And the reason being, there's no sterilising and there was no capacity to be able to keep the bottles clean. And there was also a bit of a cargo cult about feeding, you know, white babies were fed through a, a with a bottle. Um, and that's why they ended up having all the jobs and things like that. So mm. that uh, if they fed their baby with a bottle, maybe the same thing would happen. That was an interesting exercise too because my son is six foot five so he was a, a big baby and the Marys would look at him and, and wonder, you know, whether it was something special that white people had to be able to grow such big tall babies. Dill, did you take the opportunity to go to the war cemetery in Moresby when you are there? Yes, I did. I went to Bamana twice. I went on Anzac. The dawn service at Bamana is just something to behold. Words can't explain how emotional it is. But also, during Fred's time there, they discovered a, an aircraft, a Dakota, that had been bringing prisoners of war back from Java. It had misread the maps and had crashed into one of the mountains. It was up above the tree line, so it, some of those mountains go up to 16,500 feet. They'd found it, the helicopter had gone in and they'd found the people there, but they'd also found that there was a nursing sister there. And so they'd brought her body back and flew her family, her mum and dad, who were still alive, flew them up and she was buried at Bamana. And so that I went there as a representative, but also it was one of ours. So I was proud to be able to be there. That story reminds me, um, my godmother's first husband was a flight lieutenant, Don Sutliffe, and he received the American Distinguished Flying Cross. He was a highly decorated uh, combat aviator, and he lost his life in New Guinea flying in the hills and crashed. And uh, my godmother in later years shared that it was the greatest sadness for her that she'd never found out what happened to Don and that she could just picture him in some jungle, maybe dying, and, and his last thoughts of her would have been with him and, and that he had her name, Gloria, emblazoned on his plane. I've got Don's Distinguished Flying Cross in my office here in Sydney today. It's metres away from my desk where I'm speaking to you now. We lost a caribou there too. While we were there, a caribou crashed and it had 16 young Papua New Guinea cadets on board. What the Air Force was doing, the young pilots that were coming through, they'd bring them up to Papua New Guinea to teach them how to fly the special sort of conditions associated with Papua New Guinea. These young fellows come and had dinner with us that evening. Some of them had left some gear with us, you know, oh, Dell, can I leave this here? You know, we'll be back. We're only flying these cadets up to lay. Anyway, they crashed. Of course, the big scary thing is payback. And I don't know whether you've heard about payback, but in Papua New Guinea, it's a very strong thing that if I hurt your tribe, you hurt my tribe. And of course, we were the weakest link in that tribe. And so that it was pretty dangerous because I had two kids and, you know, that was a bit of a worry. Dell, you actually have an OAM. How did you earn that award? I earned that for my community work supporting veterans in my community here in the Manning Valley. How do you reflect back now on your military service? I guess it really is that it's just a one page of my life. I've raised two wonderful children. My son is serving in the Air Force and he's an airframe fitter, so that that's probably the third generation. And he has a son who um, is in the Air Force cadets and wants to join the Air Force. After Fred got out of the Air Force, we moved to the Manning Valley and we had a beef raising property. And I went back to work. He'd had his time and this was my time. I went back to work. I went back to university, did a, a graduate nursing degree and then I did a postgraduate diploma in aged care and specialised in dementia. 
I was the clinical nurse consultant, Mid North Coast Area Health Service in dementia. I've presented papers at the university, at the World Conference in Alzheimer's Disease in Edinburgh. It's only latterly that I see my service as having been as important as it was. I guess you just keep on running, don't you? Dale, it's been fascinating to hear these insights from you and to see how your Vietnam service has been so important to you and indeed shaped your life. Thank you for talking with us today and especially thank you for your service to our nation. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Never miss an episode. You can subscribe to us in your favourite podcast app, on YouTube, or by going to our website and signing up for our free e-newsletter. Our website is www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram at Life on the Line Podcast, and on Twitter at L-O-T-L Pod. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions, artwork by Big Cat Design, music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Thanks for listening, and lest we forget...